Well, you may have seen it on your way to work or school or just driving around. A new billboard has some people thinking about the Earth. And asking the question, could the Earth be flat? Oh, 0915 hours. In the distance is what appears to be mountains. But strangely enough, there is left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from middle America. 1,005 hours. I cannot see the sun anymore. We make another left turn and we spot what seems to be a large animal of some kind below us. Unlike what we've been told in school, some flat earthers imagine the earth looks like a snow globe, round but not sphere. The North Pole is at the center of most flat earth maps, with the ice of Antarctica holding everything. 1,130 hours. Countryside below is more level and normal, if I may use that word. Ahead we spot what seems to be a city. The Antarctic continent is surrounded by uh, a belt of ice, frozen seas of at least 1,200 miles thick. Now the south is a plateau. It gets in some places 14,000 feet up. I'm here to say we need to act. We don't have time for a meeting of the Flat Earth Society. Hey, welcome to The Soul Trap. We are glad to have you back with us for another episode. And we trust that wherever, whenever this episode finds you, as we always say, it finds you in good health, good spirits, and most importantly, on that good and narrow way. Well, we are going to talk about something today that is very, very fascinating to me. In fact, it's probably in the top 10, maybe even in the top five things that I have studied down through the years. And that is the nature of the earth, what lies beyond the great ice wall, what is out there. And of course, by that, what I mean is, is the world a globe, as we have been told that it is, spinning aimlessly throughout space around the sun uh, in an open environment, in an open universe that is ever expanding, never ending? Or is there something different about the nature of the earth? Are we in a closed system, a dome system, so to say? Uh, and is the Earth itself not globular, <laughs> but singular? And so we're going to be talking about that a little bit today. And in particular, we're going to be talking about what lies beyond the ice wall. And if you don't know what we're talking about, the ice wall, stick around. You will know all that you need to know and ways for you to research even more when this show is through. The Bible is probably, uh, I wouldn't even say probably, it is the strangest book that is out there. It is an amazing book. It is a book that is true from cover to cover. There is no doubt. There is no spiritualization of it. We believe as Bible believers and here at the Soul Trap that the Bible is indeed the very Word of God and the words of God. And especially in the King James, we believe that that is the inspired Word of God, that every word is perfect. For English speaking people. So we indeed believe that it is true theologically. We believe that it is true psychologically. We believe that it is true historically. And we also believe that it is true scientifically, geographically, uh, and even quantumly. Um, the Bible is true, but at times it is strange. And I mean, it's so strange because it is so far ahead of what we know. Only now is quantum physics and other branches of science even beginning to catch up to what the Bible was telling us nearly 6,000 years ago. Now, to begin, if you read the Bible as it is written, you would come away uh, universally talking about the earth and the universe and the system in which we live. If you just read the Bible, if you didn't have, uh, you know, Dr. Tyson telling you this, you didn't have Carl Sagan saying that, if you didn't have all the, the myriad of YouTube scientists telling you this and that, and if you didn't have your pseudoscientist science teacher at the government-run schools telling you something, if you just read the Bible and used empirical data, you would come away with a couple of conclusions that would be empirically supported. The first is, is that the Earth is the center of our space-time dimension, reality, and universe. The Bible clearly says that. 
that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and that the stars and the sun and the moon were put around the earth, not the other way around. Secondly, if you read your Bible as it is, you would come to the conclusion that we are in, wait for it, a domed environment, a firmament, an enclosed system. We are not in a universe that is ever expanding. That is a a faulty system in the first place, but, but that is based off of the Big Bang Theory, which is really tired and worn out, and even cutting-edge scientists don't believe in that anymore. Now, it would resemble more of what the old-time Jewish people, and quite frankly the rest of the world, believed that it was like. Now, I'm not explaining how all the other people right now could be wrong. I'm not getting into that. I'm simply saying that if you were reading the Bible and taking empirical data, no theory of relativity, none of the other things, <clears throat> you would walk away and you go, A, the earth is at the center of the universe. B, we are in a closed, fixed, domed, firmament environment. The third thing you would walk away from your Bible with this firm conclusion is that there is a definite up and a definite down. Now, I think that that's very important. And really, one of the things that I think gets lost when you, when you do a lot of studying about the nature of the earth, about geocentricity versus heliocentricity, one of the things get, that gets lost is that up is up and down is down in the Bible, not out. There is up and there is down. There is length, height, width, and breadth, but not, not out. And so you would, you would walk away thinking that and understanding that if up is up and down is down, then there would be a conceptual reality change. The next thing you would walk away from in reading your Bible is that you would come to the conclusion that the earth is not hurtling through space. It's just not, according to the Bible, nor according to the Mickelson Mori research or any other truly firm empirical research. Now, I'm not even talking about the shape of the earth at this time. I'm simply saying, even if you want to say, for the sake of argument, for what we're talking about, that the earth is a globe, the Bible and scientific evidence itself teach us that it is not hurling through space. You can read that for yourself in 1 Chronicles chapter number 16. The Bible says, Fear before him all the earth, the world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. Psalm 93 says the same thing. The Lord reigneth, he is clothed with, clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he hath girded himself. The world also is established that it cannot be moved. That's Psalm 93. Psalm 104 says the same thing in verses 1 through 5. Psalms 96 says the same thing. Uh, I could go on and on and on and on and on, and you, you get the idea. So you would walk away from the fact that we're not spinning and we're not hurling through space. We're a fixed entity. And then lastly, you would come away from the idea that we might not be shaped the way the world, the way, the way science says that we are. The Bible says that we're a footstool. And then if you look at a footstool, what you would find is that you have the average footstool is a circular top with pegs that go down. In fact, you've got four pegs that go down, and that would be your pillars of the earth. So... The fact of the matter is, is and, and I guess really the question is, if the Bible is right, and empirical data to some degree is right, one of the questions that comes up is how can so many people be wrong? Not only how can so many people be wrong, but how can they have differing ideas of what the earth is and no one calls them to boot on it, no one calls them on the carpet on it? We'll come back to that in just a moment. But I do think that behind the fad, and I am using that in quotes, the fad of the flat earth and the, the, the centricity of the earth here, I think there are questions that should be asked and answered. It's kind of popular right now in some circles to be a quote-unquote flat earther, to be a geocentrist and that kind of thing. We're not interested in the fad and popularity. We're interested in truth, the pursuit of truth. And we have always said that we reserve the right to ask the questions that make others uncomfortable, including ourselves. There are a lot of tentacles to this subject, and I don't think that any one particular show or any one particular book will answer all that is there. But I do believe that when you begin to pull on a couple threads, there are some very interesting things that start to come loose. And there are two particular big ones that come loose that really tie all of this together, and that is Operation Fishbowl 
and the mystery of Operation High Jump and Admiral Byrd. These three things, Operation High Jump, Admiral Byrd, Operation Fishbowl, they really, really, really tend to lead you down the yellow brick road of the domed earth, the firmament, and the flat earth. Now, let's start with Operation Fishbowl. Exactly what is Operation Fishbowl? Nike Hercules. Stripey XM-33. Four. Johnston Island was the center of launch and experimental activity for the 1962 high-altitude weapon effects testing termed Operation Fishbowl. But Johnston Island was only the core of fishbowl activity. Radiating out in all directions from this tiny island, 800 miles southwest of Hawaii, were instrumented stations, 266 of them, at sea, in the air, and on land, encompassing a major portion of the Pacific Ocean, all geared to collect effects data from nuclear bursts at high altitudes. So there, there's a lot of discussion, uh, both in UFO lore, a lot of discussion in, in you know, para-archaeology, para-geography lore, in, his, uh, in military history. But what is Operation Fishbowl? Well, at sonicboom.com, they do a pretty good job of bringing it into synthesis here. They say, despite the end of the Cold War, nuclear weapons are by no means obsolete having a powerful effect on international politics and strategic stability to this day. And obviously, if you're watching this or listening to this any time during the Ukraine-Russia battle, you know that that's a fear that's hanging over everyone's head. So there have always been nuclear weapons that have been going on. But exactly what was Operation Fishbowl? Well, Operation Fishbowl was a high-altitude nuclear test series conducted in 1962 as part of the larger... Operation Dominic Program. Previous high altitude nuclear tests during Hardtack 1 and Argus had provided insufficient data on the effects of high altitude nuclear de detonations, necessitating further tests during Operation Dominic. The fishbowl tests were originally planned for the first half of 1962, with three tests named Bluegill, Starfish, and Uraka. However, the first test attempt was actually delayed until June. Planning for Operation Fishbowl was begun rapidly in response to the sudden Soviet announcement on August 30, 1961, that they were ending a three-year moratorium on nuclear testing. Hey, whatever you can do, we can do better. And so we ramped up our testing opportunities and facility to try to make sure that we were keeping pace with the arms race. The rapid planning of a very complex operation necessitated many changes as the project progressed. A test named Kingfish was added during the early stages of Operation Fishbowl planning. Two low-yield tests, Checkmate and Tightrope, were also added during the project, bringing the final number of tests to five. All of the tests were launched on missiles from Johnston Island. At this location had already been established as a high-altitude nuclear test base. Despite Johnston Island's remote location, there were fears that the flash from the nighttime high-altitude detonation might cause permanent retinal injury to people living in the Hawaiian Islands. The nuclear missiles of Operation Fishbowl were launched generally toward the southwest of Johnston Island, increasing the distance from Hawaii. There were three phenomena in particular that required further investigation. The first was the effects of electromagnetic pulse generated by high altitude nuclear explosions. Now, I want to digress here for just a minute because I think that's pretty fascinating. They split the atom, but they detonated it in high altitude and what that caused was a massive electronic, electromagnetic pulse. Now, I have often said, and I believe, that when Jesus Christ returns in the rapture, the Bible says he will return to the clouds in the air. And I think it's very possible that the return of Jesus Christ in physical, spiritual form, hitting our atmosphere, 
along with millions of believers, spiritually, physically ascended, that there may be some type of global EMP, an electromagnetic phenomenon that takes place that literally shuts the, the world down, and that may create the perfect atmosphere for the arrival of the Antichrist post-rapture. But in this Operation Fishbowl, they saw the effects of electromagnetic pulse. Secondly, blackouts of radio communication in relation to military operations. Again, you see these, these strange things that are taking place. They lost the ability to communicate. And then there were the auroras associated with high-altitude nuclear explosions, especially the auroras that appeared almost instantaneously far away from the explosion in the opposite hemisphere. Now, you're going to see, and, and we'll put this on for you to be able to see, but it's very fascinating. You ought to go on your own and read uh, some of this information at sonicboom.com. But it's very fascinating that the auroras that were associated with the high-altitude nuclear explosions, you have to ask yourself, what's going on? Well, if you have an open, and I'm digressing here into speculation, but, and again, I'm not a scientist, but... <laughs> I'm not sheep either. And if you have an open firmament where it just expands and goes on, well, that, that light and that is just going to travel. But if you have a domed firmament, if you have a domed firmament, it would seem to me that there would be a little bit more, if you set off one here, that the reflection, because it's closed, the reflection might show up on the other side of that dome. Something to think about. Regardless, it was a massive test program, and it was a massive uh, scientific undertaking, a military undertaking, that they did. But the question has always been, and I think this is a valid question, was this purely a military attempt to test the benefits of nuclear power? Or is it possible, as some writers have suggested, and researchers have actually tried to ferret out, that this was an attempt to pierce the dome? that this was actually an attempt to figure out what was up there. There is good solid, and we'll get to this down the road, but there is good solid evidence that we knew as far back as Picard when he first went up, and I'm not talking about Jean-Luc, that we knew that there was a watered dome up there, that we had known this for some time but had not had the ability to get to it. Was this the United States military, the industrial military complex, was this our version of the Tower of Babel? Was this our attempt to pierce the dome and to find out what's up there? That mentioned earlier, just a moment ago, the story of Picard. There is a commercial that I believe Hennessy, and we're certainly not pushing them, but they, they did a commercial based upon the experiences and testimonies of this scientist Picard, which, by the way, his son or grandson ended up being a submariner and going to the deepest part of the sea at his time. But he actually was the first man to reach the stratosphere. There's an interesting tale that when he got there, two things. First of all, it was clearly stated that when he reached the stratosphere, he described a plain earth. Not a circular, which you should have seen. A globe, I should say. But it's also rumored that he described what you're going to see in this video, the commercial, and that is a watered dome. So what did he see? We don't know. What were the military going after? We don't know. Is it possible that Operation Fishbowl was nothing more than a nuclear test? Absolutely. Is it possible that it was more? Absolutely. Yes, it was. 
From the very beginning of time, man has tried to pierce the sky, the stars. They did so in Genesis chapter number 6. They did so in Genesis chapter number 11. It's very possible that something like that happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, which is why they had to be destroyed. And I believe you're going to see that again in the near future. It's, it's interesting. And when you look at little words that throughout the Bible, you, you keep coming back to this. Job 38, 18 says, Hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth? Declare if thou knowest it all. Well, yes, God, we have. Good try. But we have perceived the breadth of it. Isn't the earth like 25,000 miles in circumference? Well, then that verse is kind of stupid. Yeah, we got you, God. We know how big and wide it is. Unless... Unless it's, it's not a globe. Unless there are uninhabitable parts of the earth. Unless the earth is far broader and far bigger than we can ever imagine. Unless maybe there is an earth outside of the actual firmament. Another connected story to this that's very interesting, and I think a piece of the puzzle for us to, to think through is the famous and infamous Operation High Jump, journey to Antarctica to find the dome. Immediately after World War II, the U.S. Navy launched the largest military operation that had ever been undertaken to Antarctica called Operation High Jump, led by Admiral Byrd. Admiral Byrd, a 33-degree Freemason, and remember that number, 33-degree, a 33-degree Freemason led the expedition of 30 ships and 4,700 militarized soldiers. The mission had three task forces that were sent out in different directions and was to last six to eight months, but the fleet came back in just six weeks. That's a lot of money, a lot of time, and a lot of people to only last for six weeks. Admiral Byrd reported, Admiral Byrd, not, not your friendly, everyday soul trapper, you know, with his tin hat on. Admiral Byrd reported UFO sightings. But that was a public relation, uh, just catastrophe. And so they did everything they possibly could to try to hush that up. But those that are in the know, those that really believe something was taking place beyond just, hey, let's go throw snowballs at each other, they believe that what they were searching for was an electromagnetic field above the ice wall, the edge of the dome. Just several years later, the U.S. and the Russians began firing over 49 high-altitude thermonuclear rockets up into the dome with Operation Fishbowl and Dominic. So get the timeline, the order of events. Right after World War II, everybody in the United States of America said, you know what, we better get down to Antarctica. I wonder why. Well, the rumors was, now follow this thought, Operation Paperclip was when we went in and we got out all the scientists that we could from Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany was connected with Thule. Their highest level scientists were occultists. And there was rumors that Nazi Germany had designed a base or near uh, Argentina and were actually trying and even had a base on Antarctica that they had somehow connected with that. So we get our scientists from Operation Paperclip from Nazi Germany. And then all of a sudden we think, you know what, right after the war, we need to take off and go down to Antarctica. Why? And then after we get down there and we're there only six weeks, the next thing you know, we start firing rockets up, nuclear rockets, mind you, up into the atmosphere. Here's the theory. The theory is, is that the Nazi high-level scientists had in some way found something there and connected something there with Antarctica. When we brought them over with Operation Paperclip, two things we started doing. We started tinkering with nuclear bombs and we needed to go down there and find out what was going on at the ice wall. We got to the ice wall, but we can only go so far because there's an electromagnetic, some kind of a, may I say it, force field that keeps us from going beyond the habitable parts of the earth. Immediately when we realized that dome was there, we started firing rockets up into the sky to test and to find out, could we get beyond? Now, history tells us that the rockets went haywire and many had to be aborted as they tried to blast through the dome. In this presentation that has been chronicled that we've been talking about, the Antarctic expeditions as well as demonstrations of the dome itself functions 
you'll find over and over and over that though they try, they can never get through. And even on the internet today, there are some amateurs, and you can see in the video who claim that they have fired rockets up, and you can see the rocket spinning at breakneck speed until it hits something that feels and sounds like water. All of a sudden, the Russians and the U.S. signed off on a ban on any more tests of the dome as the space race and the moon missions now begin to be sold to the world. And again, there's always this connectivity that we see at the Soul Trap, right? Always there's this connectivity. Why haven't we been back to the moon? If we went to the moon, if we got through the Van Allen uh, belt, why haven't we been back to the moon? Why haven't we explored it? Why haven't we tapped it? Better yet, why haven't we been back to Antarctica or the North Pole in mass? Why is there a global cabal, a global agreement of limiting how much we can be involved in there? Is there no oil there? Is there no resources there? Are there no minerals there? There is something there, though, that the world agrees that they need to keep from everyone else. Now, interesting in all of this the historical figure by the name of Admiral Richard Byrd, and he is closely associated with the Hollow Earth Theory. So who was this man, widely considered the greatest polar explorer of the 20th century? In 1925, there was a singular man on a mission, one writer writes, to explore desolate lands rarely seen by humans at the time. Admiral Richard Byrd was his name. He went on to become the single greatest polar explorer of the 20th century a feat recognized by the American government when they awarded him the Medal of Honor. So, Admiral, Medal of Honor, great explorer, man of character, man of discipline, man of truth, not a nut job. And yet, what he saw today would be laughed, it, what he claims to have seen would be laughed at and joked about. Admiral Richard Byrd, rightly or wrongly, is now associated with the concept of the hollow earth theory because of comments that were made and because of a diary that has been in dispute. He was the leading pilot of his time, just missing the headlines and fame of having been the first to claim a transatlantic flight due to engine troubles. Charles Lindbergh's name is now etched into history instead, but Byrd was a heroic figure lauded worldwide as an American pilot, polar explorer, and organizer of polar logistics. In other words, the cat knew what he was doing. He wasn't an idiot. Okay. Admiral Richard Byrd referred to Antarctica as, quote, the land of everlasting mystery. Isn't that interesting? Of the North Pole, he said, quote, I'd like to see that land pass the North Pole. It is the center of the great unknown. I'm sorry, come, come again? Let me read that quote to you again. I'd like to see the land pass the North Pole. What land is past the North Pole that he would like to see. If you're on a globe and you're at the North Pole, my understanding is I guess there's Russia maybe, China, Canada, what, what land beyond, Alaska? What land are we talking about here, Admiral? He said, I would like to see that land past the North Pole. It is the center of the great unknown. According to some, Byrd had actually found an additional world, and they claimed in the hollow earth, though his journal was mysteriously removed by the government. That's fascinating. What was precisely discovered has always been shrouded in mystery, but it may have been astonishing, and it may have been more biblical than your textbook. Admiral Byrd, Richard Byrd, created a fantastic reputation 
in the history of the U.S. Navy. He is considered to have been brave and honest. And when he spoke about some of the sights he has seen and experienced, the government was quick to try to assassinate his character, just like they're quick to assassinate the character of anybody that goes against the standard line. I mean, we've seen that with disease. We've seen that with the war going on over in Russia and Ukraine. We've seen that with Black Lives Matter. It doesn't matter. They always go, you know, ad hominem attacks. However, in his journal, Byrd apparently informs readers of having entered into the hollow interior of the earth, along with others, and having traveled 1,700 miles over mountains, lakes, waterways, green vegetation, and animal life, the outside temperature was recorded as 74 degrees. Now, that, that blows my mind. I mean, it almost sounds fanciful, right? Uh, it almost sounds like, you know, something that's just crazy. But is it that crazy? Is it really that crazy? Now, there are two theories that I can immediately think of to go along with that, that I think are rooted really closely in the Bible. And that's how I'm theorizing this. The first one is that there is something different in the inner of the earth, inner, inner sanctum of the earth, than we realize. I mean, we know, according to the Bible, that there is a hell. The Bible says the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell, being in torture and torment, I'm tormented in this flame. But we also know that there is a place called paradise. Paradise. Is it possible that paradise is what he saw? Is it possible that mountains and lakes and waterways and green vegetation and animal life? You know, it's interesting, the connectivity. Always, always, always the connectivity of the soul trap. If you've been around for a while and listened, I think you can find the show called The Nine. Gene Roddenberry, there's a connection with Gene Roddenberry, dimensional beings, and him coming up with the story of Star Trek. And a lot of people have theorized that's why Star Trek was so cutting edge in much of his stuff, because it was being written, so to say, or at least the ideas were being given by dimensional beings. Well, in Star Trek, the wrath of Khan, I'll leave that whole thought to the side, Khan being a superhuman being, but in Star Trek, the wrath of Khan, the Genesis Project was actually formed in a dead planet. They beamed into the planet, and it was in the planet where there was a small sun, with mountains and lakes and vegetation and animal life. So is there something to that? The other thing might be is that it, it, maybe it's not inner, maybe there is something outer. In other words, we are assuming that we have explored all the seven continents, that we have reached all the lands that there are to reach. However, that's not what the United Nations thinks. If you look at the United Nations flag, you will notice that, first of all, the North Pole is in the center on a circular flat plane world. I get it, that's got all of its, we can argue about that another time. But you'll notice the flag, the, the wings that go around. It's very fascinating to think about that. Is there concentric rings of land? Are there other lands out there that have yet to be either allowed by God for us to explore, or we have not reached them. One of the things that's fascinating is, is that if you look at the U.S., the U.N. flag, world and flag, you'll notice that there are exactly 33 sections, 33 sections of the United Nations flag. And remember, Admiral Byrd was a 33rd degree Mason. I'm sure that that's probably one of those synchronistic kind of coincidences. His airplane was welcomed, he stated, by machines of a type he had never actually seen before. Some people have actually asked, when Adam and Eve were created, did they have children prior to Cain and Abel that did not partake of the sin? If they did, who were they? What were they? Where did they go? Some people have, uh, have speculated that that's where the watchers come from. Some people have even speculated that that's where Melchizedek and that king of Salem, king of righteousness, king of peace, is actually in the upside down world, as Stranger Things would talk about. But, again, I digress. He believed that his host, he, he believed, Bird, that his host informed him that he had actually been allowed to enter 
Agartha, their term for the hollow earth. Because of his high moral and ethical status, they claim that to be the protectors of the they claim to be the protectors of planet Earth to protect its inhabitants from the scurrilous activities of the power brokers and nefarious government agencies with impure agendas. That would be somewhat of what you would call a watcher. After the visit, Bird and his crew were guided back to the outer area of the Earth. The inquiry that still stays is that Admiral Bird did make a trip past the post. But this flight wasn't in February, and people are a little bit confused about the timeline. High Jump has become a contentious subject among the UFO's conspiracy theorists who claim that it was a covert U.S. Army project to control supposed secret underground Nazi establishments in Antarctica and catch the German Vril flying disks or Thule mercury-powered spaceship prototypes. Yikes. Sounds like something off of X-Files. Maybe it was that complicated. Maybe they just believed that there was something there. A legend, as one writer puts it, among those in the know was that Adolf Hitler did not actually die due to suicide in 1945, but he fled to this bunker in Argentina to an SS base carved under the ice in New Swabia during the very early years of 1950s, where he resumed his passion as a painter according to this account. Operation High Jump, the biggest exploration ever to target Antarctica, was organized to not only find what was there, but to erase the Nazi presence at the South Pole. Now, whether or not that's true, it, 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 it's not as far-fetched as we may think. Fascinatingly, in 1956, Admiral Byrd led yet another expedition to the South Pole. Admiral Byrd explained that the North and South Poles are just two of several openings into the center of the Earth. In other words, from his perspective, he believed that at the top and at the bottom you could go into the center of the Earth. But what if it was different? What if his mind was still shackled by a globular model? What if they were not north and south entrances into the inner of the earth? What if they were going out further? Admiral Forrestal was the first United States Secretary of Defense and among the initial founding members of the Majestic 12, an elite group of powerful government and industrial leaders who were tasked with keeping an eye on all of this alien activity. William Cooper, in Another Connectivity, goes into great detail in the special report entitled, entitled William Cooper's Deadly Secrets, and he believed that Forstall was actually killed because of what he knew and his inability to keep it. Some people actually believe that William Cooper was killed. By the way, my brakes are fine, and I'm not suicidal. Majestic 12 was originally conceived by a man named Jesse Marcel, who had been involved with the first Roswell UFO event. Majestic 12 was the alleged code label of a secret committee of experts, military top leaders, and government authorities supposedly developed in 1947, right at about the time we're launching missiles up into the air and exploding them, and right at about the time when we're going out to the edge of the ice wall trying to figure out where we are, lo and behold, out of nowhere, we have this massive influx now of sightings. It started and it built, so much so that we had to have Majestic 12, eventually Project Blue Book, and on and on we go. Forstall and Bird got into hot water history tells us, by thumbing their noses at the authorities who demanded absolute silence. They collaborated into go in, in going public with the tales regarding the Roswell accident and the internal planet. Some believe Admiral Forrestal was assassinated, and within a couple of weeks of Byrd's self-imposed expatriation, he was likewise dying. His journal was linked after his death, but never completely discovered. All of this, one writer says, begs the question, just what happened with Admiral Byrd in the North Pole? He believed that people or creatures populated the center of the Earth. And he described them as being incredibly tall, very humanoid creatures that were extremely advanced. The gap in the Antarctic is said to be where these creatures fly out and fly back in. There is a hole, quote unquote, allowing very civilization to dwell inside the world. Now, on a side note, it's interesting to think, too, because 
You have to wonder about that a little bit. In Isaiah 66, 6, 6, when you read, you'll find that during the tribulation, or I should say during the millennium, there will actually be a gateway, a viewing portal, so to say, the Bible says, into hell. Fascinating. Fascinating. Past the South Pole is what Byrd believed was the great unknown. It is said that there is a U.S. regulation to prevent citizens from checking out caverns and holes in the polar regions. You were forbidden to enter into a cave with an opening without a federal cave license. Who ever heard of a federal cave license or a government cavern expert with you? Any type of area with caves are otherwise considered to be on federal government property. Also, it was common knowledge that planes were forbidden to fly directly above the North Pole. Why? So... You have to ask yourself, will this ever be confirmed? I don't know. But you listen to him and watch the video and tell me what do you think. Is this man lying or is this man telling you the truth? I must say that Admiral Byrd, our guest tonight, is not only our greatest living explorer, but he's been an inspiration to countless Americans. Admiral Byrd, you've been to both the North Pole and the South Pole. Is there any unexplored land left on this earth? that might appeal to adventurous young Americans? Uh, yes, there is. And not up around the North Pole because it's getting crowded up there now because they find out it's really usable, not only to live in, but militarily. But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from middle America. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that unexplored. That's a tremendous So challenge. there's a lot of adventure left down at the bottom of the world. Well, well, do you so fundamentally, when you see that, it is, it is beyond, it's almost beyond imagination to think that this could be true. But maybe it is. You have to ask yourself, was this man mad? Was he mistaken? Was he lying? Or was there something that he saw there that the Bible seems to very clearly teach you, at least in an immaterial way. Of course, we don't have to just take an admiral's word for it. There is one of the most famous and most powerful and yet often most underrated scientists ever, and that is Nikola Tesla. You may not believe the nuclear tests or the decorated admiral, but anyone who has read Tesla and his works knows two things. You know, first of all, he's arguably the greatest scientist of the 20th century. You also know he operated his amazing technology based upon a closed system domed earth model, which is why he is never studied by mainstream science and history. The Tesla shield used and contributed to the electromagnetic dome. One writer says it this way, Tesla's discovery can eventually remove every conceivable external human limitation. If we humans ourselves can elevate our consciousness to properly utilize the Tesla electromagnetics, the Nikola Tesla who gave us the electrical 20th century in the first place may yet give us a fantastic new future, more shining, interesting word, and glorious than all the great scientists and sages have imagined. Tom Bearden wrote that, and he may be true. You are living in the 20th and 21st century in a world that Nikola Tesla opened up. And the question is, if he opened that up here on the earth, based upon a closed model, is there more that could be opened up? It was not just Nikola Tesla as well. Thomas was awarded the 1906 Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of the electron and for his work on the conduction of electricity and gases. Eight of his students and his son, George Paget Thomas, also became Nobel Prize winners, either in physics or in chemistry. He also worked with a closed system. Electromagnetic mass was initially a concept of classical mechanics, denoting as to how much the electromagnetic field or the self energy is contributing to the mass of charged particles. So due to this self induction effect, scientists tell us, electrostatic energy behaves as having some sort of momentum and apparent electromagnetic mass, which can increase the ordinary mechanical mass of bodies. Well, that's a lot of talk and what it basically means is is there is an unlimited amount of self-sustaining energy that can be tapped into through the electromagnetic power grid 
that is both on the earth and the dome. And the reason that the dome and the earth, it is speculated, posited, has this electromagnetic yield is because there is a connection between the two, unlike a separated atmosphere and an open environment. The fact of the matter is, whether you believe the fishbowl, whether you believe Admiral Byrd, whether you believe Tesla, it goes on and on, and you can go as far back as not just the Bible, but Enoch. Of course, we know that Enoch is not in any way canonical. Enoch is not scripture given by inspiration of God. Not all of it, at least. There is some mention in the book of Jude. And we do know that the Apostle Paul was highly aware of, of the book of Enoch. But if you look at Enoch as simply a historical document, it is fascinating that in chapter 1, it deals with the constitution of the world and the disposition of the elements. Let me take just a moment to read this to you, and it's going to sound eerily like the book of Genesis. But it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. But when the earth did not come into sight, but was covered with thick darkness, and a wind moved upon its surface, God commanded that there should be light. Okay, that's coming from Enoch, so far so good, very similar to, to the book of Genesis. And when that was made, he considered the whole mass and separated the light and the darkness, and the name he gave to one was night and the other he called day. He named the beginning of light and the time of rest, the evening and the morning, and this was indeed the first day. But Moses said it was one day, the cause of which I'm able to give even now. But because I have promised to give such reasons for all things in a treaty by itself, I shall put off its exposition till at that time. Okay, more kind of, you know, gobbledygook there. He goes on to say, After this, on the second day, he placed the heaven over the whole world and separated it from the other parts, and he determined it should stand by itself. He also placed a crystalline firmament round it. That's exactly what Job says. That's exactly what Revelation says. Job talks about the frozen deep. Revelation says before the throne of God there was a sea. He says there was a crystalline firmament around it and put it together in a manner agreeable to the earth and fitted it for giving moisture and rain and for affording the advantages of dews. On the third day he appointed the dry land to appear with the sea itself round about it and on the second day dry land to appear with the sea itself round about it. And on the very same day, he made the plants, seeds, and on and on and on it goes. The truth of the matter is, the early church fathers also write quite a bit, wrote quite a bit about the crystalline firmament. And when you read the early church fathers, you see them reading the Bible and coming to their conclusions, much as Luther did, much as Calvin did. I had somebody ask me one time, hey, are you a flat earther? And I'll always reply, I believe the earth and the universe and the constitution of being exactly the way the Apostle Paul did exactly the way Jesus Christ did, exactly the way the book of Isaiah did. You say, what is that? Read those writings and you tell me. In chapter 89, talking about the deluge and the deliverance, Enoch says this, and again, I raised mine eyes toward heaven and saw a lofty roof with seven water torrents thereon. And those torrents flowed with much water into an enclosure. Now, the Bible uses the term windows of heaven. Hold your thought there. Windows of heaven. What are we talking about? A window is something that allows you to see from one side to the other. Not a door, a window. Now, the Bible does say, the Bible does say in the book of Revelation that I saw a door open. And that's because John had to go up. But the window of heaven. So Enoch is saying, I saw a roof a dome, and I saw seven torrents. He goes on and says in verse 3, And I saw again, and behold, fountains were open on the surface of that great enclosure, and that water began to swell and rise upon the surface, and I saw that enclosure to all its surface was covered with water. And the water, the darkness, and mist increased upon it, and as I looked at the height of that water, that water had risen above the height of that enclosure, and was streaming over that enclosure, and it stood upon the earth. In other words, what you're reading right there is you're reading about a domed earth. You're reading about a plain earth. You're reading about something that is fundamentally different than what we are told. 
I could go on and on. I'm simply going to give you two recommendations and then cut and run before I totally lose you completely. But there is a good book called The Flat Earth Conspiracy by Eric Dubay. Again, I don't agree with it 100%, but it is well worth the read. And probably one of the most profound books that I have ever read, and have, I believe I've mentioned this before, is Edward Henry, The Greatest Lie on Earth, Proof That Our World Is Not a Moving Globe. So what do we take away from all of this? I mean, it's, it's fun to talk about. But the question is, how could we be right and an entire world be wrong? How could... We say, no, 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 this is the nature of the earth, and yet scientists and uh, physicists, and you go down the list, they all believe that. Well, I ask you a question. How can the smartest, oh, oh, we're sitting here in the studio, what's the guy's name? Neil, Neil Tyson DeGrasse? Uh, or something like that? Yeah. yeah. So... <laughs> If you sat down and I told him what I just told him right here, he, he, he would laugh at me and say, you're an idiot. But he's the one that goes on national TV, watch the video, and says that the earth is pear-shaped. Um, so, so you spin, you know, when you spin pizza dough, it kind of flattens out. It gets wider in the middle. And so earth, throughout its life, even when it formed, it was spinning. And it got a little wider at the equator than it does at the poles. So it's not actually a sphere. It's, an, it's oblate. And officially it's an oblate spheroid, that's what we call it. But not only that, it's slightly wider below the equator than above the equator. A little chubbier. A little chubbier. Yeah. Chubby is a good word. It's like pear-shaped. Yeah. So it turns out the pear-shapedness is bigger than the height of Mount Everest above sea level. Who's the idiot, man? Every single photo that you give to me to tell me what the Earth looks like, it ain't a pear. It ain't even close to a pear. It doesn't even resemble a pear. An avocado. It's a perfect spherical ball. Who's the idiot? Oh, and by the way, he would also have you believe, and he full well believes, that you and I came from a little amoeba, mutated up, sprung a couple arms, a tail, swung from a tree, and the next thing you know, I'm sitting here behind an apple doing recordings with you. How can they believe that? I'll tell you how. I'll tell you how. And I, and I think it's a rational response. I don't know that it explains everything, but I think that there is a rational response to this. How can they be wrong and, and, and do that? I think it is the great delusion. Romans chapter number one says, in verse number, verse number, oh, verse number 19, because that, which may be, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Let that sink in. There are certain invisible things of God that the Bible says are clearly seen. The invisible things of him are clearly seen being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. That's what I think the answer is. I think the truth of the matter is, at the top of the pyramid of conspiracy, there are a few that are in the know. And the further you work your way down, the more delusion, the more darkness, the more confusion that there is. Because the truth of the matter is, the Bible says that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned. I would submit to you that almost every conspiracy, every philosophy, every dogma that has done great damage within the last 400, 500 years, in one way, shape, or another, can trace itself back to the fact and the change that you and I are no longer at the center of the universe, that you and I are no longer meaningful to God, that you and I are no longer in a system designed for us, enclosed for us, created for us. I would submit to you that Darwin and Run Right On Ford, all of that is rooted in the fact that somewhere back there, in a tremendous chess move, a poison, a virus, so to say, was introduced into the mechanical thinking of man that said, you are simply a speck 
on a ball that is free flowing through space and universe without meaning, without reason, without connectivity. And from there has flowed every false philosophy. When in fact you are not a speck, you are not on a flowing ball, you are not this thing hurling through space. But in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. He created a firmament. That earth is fixed. That dome is there. That throne is there. There is an inner earth. The material and the immaterial are not real and unreal, but two sides to the same coin. And the fact of the matter is, the earth is what the Bible says that it is. The earth is God's footstool. Draw me a footstool. And then go on Google and take a look at the CGI picture of the earth. And you tell me. Maybe the ultimate act of faith, maybe the ultimate act of let God be true and every man a liar, is deciding. Do you believe in a footstool or a basketball? The choice is yours. Thanks for listening. Is there any unexplored land left on this earth? Unexplored land left on this earth. You are here because you knew something. You knew something that's never been seen by human beings. Is there any unexplored land left on this earth? What you know, you can't explain. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the sun. Is there any unexplored land left on this earth? And that's beyond, and that's beyond, 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 beyond. And uh, I think it's quite stunning.